All right, it's Jeff Mayhew, and I'm going to try this solo podcast thing again. So here we go. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a few different things. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little history. We're going to talk a little history of the formation of the government and kind of where the conception of like modern day political parties started. Um, and we're going to talk a little personal. We're going to talk a little uh, Book of Job, uh, just a conversation I had with a friend. I read it today. Just had some notes I wanted to chat about. And uh, at the end here, we're going to have a little uh, little parenting, husbanding uh, conversation. Uh, I had a new article out in the Freeman newsletter about balancing parental rights with authority. And or balancing authority with parental rights. I can't even remember the name of my own article. I'm so good at that. Uh, and then just a little story about a little tiff Vanessa and I had today uh, and kind of how people see things differently. And, you know, it's kind of communication on how we figure it out. So um, let's get started with um, a little refresher of like American history. So where did we come from? Uh, we came from Britain, most of us at the time. Um, we were 13 independent colonies. And there was this little thing that happened called the French and Indian War. And what that was is the French and the Indians were encroaching on the colony's sovereignty. They were battles and the colonies needed to defend themselves. And Britain stepped up. They sent troops and they fought this war, kind of protecting the colonies, protecting their interest. Um, but that's expensive. <laughs> It costs money. And so they started taxing. They started taxing the American uh, the American people, the colonies. And the colonies didn't really like this. Um, nobody really likes to get, get taxed. But it's not that uh, the colonies were opposed to it. It's what was important. What's important to note about this is it was about how the taxes were applied, who they were applied to, and when they were applied. Um, and so we kind of disagreed. We sent, uh, we sent actually Benjamin Franklin to parliament to make this argument, which was, yes, we're willing to pay some taxes, but we'd like a little representation in parliament as a say in those taxes. So we can, you know, administer them the best way we know how, or that can help. And, uh, we were rejected. Uh, this became our battle cry. Everybody knows that. Uh, no taxation without representation. Uh, that's famous for D.C. right now, but that was originally, you know, chanted about in uh, in the colonies. And that no taxation of, without representation led to the American Revolution. It led to the Declaration of Independence, where we freed ourselves, uh, declared ourselves an independent and sovereign nation. We formed together to fight the American Revolution. Uh, we won. And then real life kicks in, you know? <laughs> like, now, now Britain's not there to defend us anymore. Now we have to pay back all these debts that we occurred uh, during the war. And the first government that the United States formed was the, it was formed under the Constitution was called the Articles of Confederation, and this was a confederation of states. And um, the confederation of states was formed in 1781, and it went till 1789. Uh, it the Articles formed one legislative body filled with delegates chosen from state legislatures. Each state had one vote. The Articles empowered Congress to handle foreign impair and foreign affairs. They could declare war, make treaties, borrow money on the United States credit. However, they couldn't impose taxes or regulate interstate or foreign commerce, and they could only request money from the states. So this made it basically it was all the different states, the different republics with a very tiny federal government with very little power. It couldn't enforce the rules that it had. And so we had a lot of, during this time period, there was a lot of uh, bickering between states, uh, between what was supposed to be done, how we were paying off our debts, how we were collecting taxes. Uh, it was difficult. And so the 
high taxes in some of the states and the debt issue created economic hardship for many and particularly farmers. And this hardship led to something called Shays Rebellion. And so Shays Rebellion was a violent uprising that caused fear of anarchy and insurrection. This was in 1787. Uh, it was led by Daniel Shea. He took a group of uh, 1,200 and attempted to seize a federal armory. Uh, he was It was defended off by the state militia. And it was kind of a wake-up call for the people in charge of the government. Um, James Madison and others uh, basically convened a convention to deal with these issues that caused Shays Rebellion. And that convention ended up writing our new constitution. It was the federal convention. Um, and in that federal convention, we basically scrapped our Articles of Confederation and we came up with a new constitution. And that constitution was much more detailed. Um, and this is kind of where the origins of the parties come from, because it was in this debate that you got the formation of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And so what a Federalist was at this time was someone who wanted a strong central government and believed that the federal government should be superior in limited form. And an anti-federalist preferred a confederation of states with a weak central government. Um, that was essentially the first government we had. It wasn't really working. That's why we were doing the Constitution. But they were very concerned with the concentration of power, something over top of the states. They had worked, they had lived relatively independently for a really long period of time, and it was kind of working out. And they figured as long as they weren't having to work, you know, if they work small, it's easy. I think the issue here was the people looking bigger now that you were a nation, an independent nation, when foreign affairs, you know, the French weren't going to go anywhere. The British were, weren't going to go anywhere. You still had this um, nation as a one that you had to defend um, and, and operate, you know, to make efficient. And so the federal constitution, uh, the federal convention sought to alleviate these problems. And so let's go to, what do we got here? So this is a, uh, this is a letter from Madison to Jefferson in 1787. And it's kind of talking about what, why, why they have the federal convention, what they're trying to accomplish. And it is to unite a proper energy in the executive and proper stability in the legislative departments with essential characters of Republican government. And so that's number one that he has on his list. Um, let me go ahead and read through the rest and then I'll come back to that. So to draw a line of demarcation, which would give the general government every power requisite for the general purposes and leave to the states every power which might be most beneficially administered by them, provide for the different interest of different parts of the union to adjust the clashing pretensions of the large and small states. So we'll go back to the first one, the characteristics of or characters of a Republican government. So the key character of a Republican government as we created or saw it, we being the United States, we being Madison and all the writers, is this idea that Republican government is best at dividing, separating, and balancing power. And that is ultimately what government at its core is, should do. Um, it, you know, Balance it enough to keep you safe and sovereign. Balance it enough to keep the independent, the domestic workings functional and the people growing and happy. Um, and if you can successfully balance all of the different powers, you're able to balance all the different interests, um, which was number three, provide for the different interests of different parts of the union, right? And so how did how did we do this in the federal republic? So we divided power between three okay it was the executive branch which the anti-federalist 
wanted to be very weak. They they did not want a strong executive. They did not want a strong federal government. And then we took the Congress, which of the states was just the states with one per vote, and we created this, what Madison called a compounded republic. But I I tend to, to call it a layered republic. I think layered is is a better terminology for the way I see the government working. I don't know, you know, Madison got to see it in his time. I got to see what how it worked afterwards, and I feel like layered's a better word, and we'll get into that later. But um so this it was a it was a layered republic between the states and the people of the states, right? Because what was Shay's Rebellion? Shay's Rebellion was a group of people who didn't feel represented. And they didn't feel represented because each state got one vote. And small states had equal to big states. So you had, you know, all of these different, you know, groups of power because people are power and the you know, there's more people here and there's less people here, but your power is equal to my power, but I actually have more people than you have and all these different things. And I have more land, but you have more people. And all these different factors played a role. And what the, the bicameral Congress did is it came in, it understood that, and it tried its best to divide it as fairly as possible. If that's, you know, I don't know, fair is, is a term you can get in government, but as and and it it definitely wasn't equal as proportionally as possible i think is is the best way to put it and so the bicameral congress gave each state or it gave it was the senate which was the states and the house which was the people of the states okay and the states had representation fixed at two so small and and small and large states were equal and that every state was equal in that uh regard however the people of the states was apportioned by population. Now, this is important. It's very, very important to understand um, as we take this lesson forward into the, the 20th century about this apportionment. Um, and what this did is kind of, it broke the groups down into smaller because before you had 13 independent groups. Now you have 13 independent groups layered on top of the individual congressional districts inside of the states. Now, I don't have the numbers up to say, but let's say that, let's say that you had two senators in the state of Virginia, and based on the population at the time, you had, I don't know, eight congressional representatives, right? And so what this does is it gives the people more people of power to talk to. It is, I think it's brilliant, and the idea of it's kind of just communicating. It's just you know, having one group communicate with another group, communicate with another group. The Senate was based off of the state legislatures. This is the idea. Of, this is kind of like your aristocracy part of the government, um, which, look, you're going to have. It's never going to be. You don't want a solid, you don't want everything to be an aristocracy. But that's kind of what the Senate was, which is designed that way. It's kind of good if it was functioning that way. But that has to be balanced with the people. And the people isn't supposed to be an aristocracy. Uh, it should be the common people. It should be the regular people. Um, that's why it was the Senate was six years per term. The House was two years per term. It's to, to create a change of office. It's to create uh, opportunity to swiftly enact change in your government should it get off course. Um, so, but we'll, we'll kind of dive into the apportionment part in the House later. But for now, for the purposes of today's conversation and the parties, what's important to know is that the original parties, if you will, and they weren't technically parties, was the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. Um, the Federalist on one side at the time was James Madison, uh, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay. They famously wrote the Federalist Papers, as I showed earlier. Uh, some of the Anti-Federalists were was uh, Patrick Henry, George Mason, uh, I believe, is it DeWitt? Was DeWitt an Anti-Federalist? I think, I think so, but um, James Wilson, I believe, was an Anti-Federalist. Um, and so that's where the first like separation of us came from, because we were united to free ourselves from Britain. And as we formed one big group, that group immediately started to separate itself from one another based on differing viewpoints of government, right? It wasn't about what you wanted and what I wanted. It was about how do we make the decisions in that? Now, a lot of 
how people wanted to make decisions was based on how they thought they could get the, what they wanted in government. But a lot of people at this time period, having gone through what they just went through, were really looking forward more than today. And they were trying to create a, a lasting system that would create lasting peace in, in their country. And so the first parties were basically like, how did how does government function? How should it work? You know, and that's how the creating the constitution and, um, you know, as it goes forward, it kind of transitioned into how can we make government do what we want, you know? And so the, we formed the constitution. We have the first presidency, which is George Washington. Um, and so now we get the formation of parties uh, real political parties. Alexander Hamilton is kind of the the first driving force behind this. Uh, the Federalist formed their kind of the first political party. Uh, they believed in a strong central government headed by a robust executive department, and the Constitution provided the federal government with power over the states whenever the general welfare of the people was concerned. And so this was a this was recognizing that. The Constitution was created to keep the keep the states in order in a little bit, but it kind of took that and expanded it through this general welfare clause, which was uh, it's Article One, Section Eight, and it basically said it it you know for the general welfare purposes necessary and proper. I believe is is it necessary and proper? Hold on. Where's my constitution here? So let's see. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution on foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or any department or office therefore of. I'm missing something here. Should have highlighted it before I started, right? Oh, right here. Uh, the Congress shall have the power to lay tax, lay and collect taxes, duties, impo impost and excess excises to pay the debt and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. So between general welfare and necessary and proper, there's some pretty vague terms. Um, and, you know, when you leave when things are vague, it gives opportunity for people to redefine or stretch their de definition. And so this was the Federalist idea. And look, it's not to say that the Federalists were wrong. I mean, what happened? What what so let's let's get to the the other party first. So this was the Federalist at the time, uh, your most famous ones were Alexander Hamilton and John Adams. Um in response to the Federalist Party. The Democratic Republican Party was formed, and it was formed by mainly James Madison, that guy right there, uh, Thomas Jefferson, um, and they believed in a strong central government led led by a bicameral Congress of the states and the people of the states. They believed the executive was the administrator of the people's will. They did not believe that the executive spoke for the people. They believed that was done through Congress. This is a big dis distinction. Hamilton and his idea of power said, well, the people need somebody to act. The Federalists were the government of action. Things needed to be done. Commerce needed to be had. We needed systems in place, and Congress was too slow to act. So Hamilton and Washington and his cabinet, in a large degree, used this, the, the you know, Article 1, Section 8, for the general welfare and they were able to do a lot of things that were that were actually necessary that maybe congress should have been doing but they weren't doing 
The problem with that is when you open up the floodgates, now you can start to do, maybe they're doing too much, you know, maybe they're doing too much, um, where the Democratic Republican, you know, the Federalist idea was a government that acts and the Federalist idea or the, the Democratic Republican idea was a government that acts when necessary. And, and who decides who's necessary? And I think that's why having a layered republic with the executive, the leg of the state, and the people of the states, uh, basically it's your king, your aristocracy, and your people. If you've got your three classes, your three main classes, every everything divides into different sections. And so you have these three different sections. You give each one of these sections a part of power, you give them representation, you give them uh, rules and structure on our limitations to their power and um, not just limitations, but like sp specific powers that they're supposed to actually act on. And you leave the other stuff to the smaller state republics. That's where you got the federal republic layered over top of the state republic layered over top of these divided executive king state, senates, aristocracy, people, house, power. And so um, I kind of lost my place. Here. Oh, I know. So think of it like this. So let me get my whiteboard in here. Hold on one second. Yes, I have a whiteboard, a giant whiteboard. I need a smaller one for this. And so think of it like this. Uh, the Federalist believed in kind of a hierarchy of power like this. So this is the, the executive, and then you had the bicameral Congress divided underneath. All right. So the Senate and the House. Now, the way that the Democratic Republicans view this is kind of like, where's, oh, my kids took my eraser. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. All right, I'm back. All right, so the Federalist believed in this. I don't know if that's spelled right, but we got the light. You can't tell anyways. I'm a terrible speller and it's hard to write here. So the way that the Democratic Republicans viewed things was like this. So. This puts the Congress superior to the executive. This puts the executive superior to Congress. Now, how it really functions or how we should want it to function is kind of, kind of like this, but not quite. Let me show you. We want it to function like this. This is what's great about our layered republic. It's it's kind of it's a sphere, it's a circle, it's it's whatever. So depending on what's going on and what the rules say, like who is supposed to be in charge, then they're in charge. You know, when the exec when it's in the executive's department, they're superior to the states and the house. When it's in Congress's department, they're superior to this. Now, we're gonna find that there is an issue when it comes to, through this debate in Congress uh, for the federal com com uh, convention, there was always a debate over apportionment, over representation. I kind of mentioned that already. And so, and that's kind of this situation, the state and the house, that fight, the fact that they are kind of co-equal branches and there's no defined role, they both share that apportionment thing. The Senate then has a little control a little more power than the house because of that. Now there's also the 14th amendment. We can, you know, 
there's a big rabbit holes we can get down and we'll, we'll talk about that as we get forward that kind of basically there are a lot of different balancing power issues that we need to discuss as we go forward as a nation this is one of them so let's bring it back to the parties and what they believe this this is what this is what we want And this is what we have. This is what we had. We had the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. And it was the division the original division of the parties was formed by who was in charge. Who got to say what? Which, what, what was the what was the, uh, the pull apart from Britain? Was it taxes? No. It was who got to decide where was the power where was the representation it is always the essential argument of government is who's in charge because whoever writes the rules then the, then they're on the the side of the laws with them you know and so that was one of the things that uh, our congress did is we gave the right we gave the responsibility to writing the laws to congress Okay, not to the executive. It's not the executive's decision to write for the people. It's the people's decision to write their own rules in the House of Representatives, and the and the states can do that as well. Um, and so, as as we saw, or you know, as we see throughout history here, the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist changed. The Anti-Federalist went away. The Federalists became something a little bit different. And then this new force was created, the Democratic Republican. And it was Republic force. And it was always about who is in charge. How are you going to get what you want? So the this is you start to see the pull apart of different interests here at this time period as well. Most of the Democratic Republicans were Southerners. Uh, you had slaveholders and you had um you had, uh, you know, just the more de decentralized power people. And then in the Federalist, you had merchants and commerce and uh, banking, you know, commerce. Um, so, you know, that's where your your interests start to be formed at this period of time um, with these two parties. And so... I need a sip of my coffee. Sorry, I've been talking. I just talk and talk and talk. So, the uh, we'll go back to go back just a little bit to the uh, the ratifying convention here. So again, you know, as we look at modern day parties, we we kind of separate them like this is pro this, anti this, pro that, anti that. And most, for the most part, I think the modern day Republican and Democratic parties operate off the same function of government, which is whoever, whatever I want, when I win power, I get to do. So the Republican structure is let's win the presidency, Congress, you know, the Senate and the House. And if you elect my party, then I can I can act the way that you want. And the Democrats are the same way. And so they're both kind of this federalist party, if you will, where they're a government of action. And that action is only focused in their group's interest. And so that's kind of not how the system's designed, is it? Because what did Madison say? What did, what did we read earlier? Um, to provide for the different interest of different parts of the union. But in reality, you don't really get that. The state parties kind of have a lot of power over the congressional representatives. And so if, you know, you're a representative of a different part of your state, you have different needs and different interests, but 
it, depending on what the majority of your state is in your state republic, it's difficult for that to get done. And so this stems a lot from apportionment. It stems a lot from the, uh, like, who gets to vote, how they get to vote, what your vote counts for. Um, and the remember the key issue that led to the federal convention was this this inability this inefficiency of the government along with a lack of representation um there was a group of people who felt so so unrepresented they stormed an armory like they risked their lives those people were hung and killed they gave their lives for this cause um and you know we don't really know what was going on in the day to day. We don't know what other ops options they have, but we have to try to think maybe they exhausted their options. Maybe people weren't listening. There was no mechanism for these people to be heard because when we created the house, this power of the people, farmers were part of the process, right? Like that was the idea is like regular people need to be able to get in, into here. And right now the states have all the power the state legislatures have all the power and it's this you know it, it is this aristocracy this generational aristocracies that get born generation after generation it'd be hard for you know people to get represented in that so what was let me see here page and mark my page i have all these pages marked and the one that i wanted to start with somehow oh there it is i found it i did mark it look at me okay so uh this is from a book called ratification the people debate the constitution 1787 to 1788 this is a great read if you really want to dive in and understand what's going on um or what was going on at this point in time um, I highly recommend this and uh, Madison's. I've got it back there. Madison's notes, so you can kind of get yourself. There's also regular state ones as well. But so, what was one of the big uh, arguments? Is if we're going to divide the power between the states and the people of the states, well, how much power? Who gets the power? Where's the representation coming from? And so, this is uh, George Mason, who was an anti federalist. Uh, the document, he said, and he's talking of the Constitution. The document, he said, did not include a Bill of Rights or a declaration of any kind for preserving liberty of the press, trial by jury in civil cases, or against the danger of standing armies in time of peace. And that was a quote. Uh, Mason, like Washington and Madison, objected to the, so the small size of the first House of Representatives, which gave the people, quote, the shadow only of representation, although he later noted that the problem was reduced by the convention's decision on its final day to change the provision so there could be one representative for every 30,000 rather than one representative for every 40,000. So one of the hottest debates that we ever have in government is over representation. Who gets how much power is the house going to get? Why does the house exist? What is the purpose of it? And, and that is to give power to regular people, to balance the power of the king and the aristocracy with the plebeians, essentially. And to try to make that as balanced as possible. And so that's where that's where apportionment comes, uh, comes from. And our original document was one in 30, 40,000, changed to one in 30,000. It was supposed to be written into the Bill of Rights. Now, this is a, this is from a state uh, ratifying convention in Virginia's, and he's talking about how it doesn't have a Bill of Rights. That's something that came out of the conventions. We ended up writing and adding a Bill of Rights to the Constitution, which I think was, was good. Um, but I lost, my, I lost my spot. I get rambling. I get talking and I lose my spot. Um, but the, um, 
Oh, I don't remember. So the house, remember slavery? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always a problem in our government, right? Uh, slavery is bad. And slavery caused part of an issue with how we counted uh, representation. So um, three-fifths of a person, which basically gave Southern states additional power in Congress. So if you remember that little chart here about how uh, the House and the Senate was bicameral, well, by counting the the population by three-fifths, the slave population as three-fifths of a person, but not actually giving them the right to vote, they are shadow of representation only. It tilted power in the favor of the Southern slaveholder states, both in Congress. In Congress. And so that's important to note as we move forward as well. Um, but, you know, back to this, what was what was uh what was the fight over what was the what, what are we what are we what are we supposed to care about as as citizens like what should our government be talking about what should we care about and we should care about our power we should care about how we get things done and i think a lot of people out there right now feel unrepresented um i mentioned in my last show about the chaos candidate and the conformity candidate and the parties give you who the parties want to give you and how January 6th was wrong and bad, but also it was kind of like Shays Rebellion. It was a group of people that said they were unrepresented. And four years later, we've done nothing about it and we're not talking about the right things. And it's because our leaders don't educate us. They don't tell us what's going on. They're not honest. If they were, what they would say is we as Republicans believe that the government should act. And we as Democrats believe the government should act. And what they believe is the government should act in their interest, the Democrat interest or the Republican interest. And nobody is looking out for the interest of the people. And that's because a lot of the mechanisms have been broken off. And we don't talk about it. <laughs> so uh, one of the concerns, uh, so Henry Lee, uh, one of the concerns that he had was dangerous blending of the legislative and executive powers now think about that and think about you know back to what do the modern day parties tell us and what are what can we take away from that and they say all right we want we want to build the wall okay so if we're going to build the wall i need i need you to go out and vote for your republican congressional member your Republican senator, and your Republican president. And we need those three powers blended together underneath the Republican Party, and we're going to build your wall for you. And if you don't like that, you can go to the other side. And if you're a Democrat and they can say, well, we want health care, or we want environmental reform or legislation or whatever, and they say, okay, go out and vote for your Democratic congressional rep, your Democratic state senator, and your Democratic presidential nominee, and... We'll have the power, we'll save the republic, and we'll get those things done for you. We will act. And none of those things are really what we were designed to be. Uh, none of those things really represent the checks and ba balance uh, you know, system that was created um, for the purposes that Madison pointed out of being able to give you know, power to the different interests and parts of the union to adjust for the classing, clashing of the large and small states. I mean, does that really happen now? And to unite the proper energy in the executive and legislator, the proper energy, the proper energy. What is it? What is Madison referring to with the proper energy? Well, he's saying for the things that we tell them they're allowed to do, what does the constitution say they're allowed to do? In those circumstances, yes, they should act. But outside of those circumstances, they should not. They should defer to the places that the Constitution says, to the to the powers that the Constitution says should act. And if they disagree with that, there is a place in a way to, uh, what's the right word? Find, the, find it, right? Maybe there's a new power. Maybe there's something new, which we will talk about, immigration, right? That's a new power problem it was you know congress should write laws about it and that's kind of what led to this appropriation act thing that we were talking about in the last episode and so there is a mechanism for us to solve problems but we we don't act in the right way we're not acting in writing rules for the future we're acting in solving the problems of 
of, of the past, really, of like trying to, you know, build a wall because we haven't written immigration, like real, real immigration reform. So let's build a wall to keep people out. And it's like, yeah, I, I get it. You know, maybe there's there's a place for some walls. But I mean, really, we need some rules if we want to make the wall more effective. Um, and back to, you know, Henry Lee is that, that blending of the legislature and the executive. What do we get all the time now? We get executive orders. That's kind of the blending of the legislature and the executive. The executive is now dictating what the law should be. And uh, I don't necessarily, I mean, executive orders have been around for a really long period of time, but it feels like, it feels like we do that a lot too, way too much nowadays. And so uh, this is Madison from a speech, I believe that was from the convention. It's uh, the right of suffrage is certainly one of the most fundamental articles of Republican government, the right to vote, the right for the people to have representation and ought not to be left to, to be regulated by the legislature. A gradual abridgment of this right has been the mode in which aristocracies have been built on the ruins of popular forms. So I bring that up because uh, as we fast forward and we see the parties shift and change, um, which, you know, the the... The Federalist Party eventually dies. The Democratic Republican Party kind of turns into the Democratic Party. It's like it's just new things that are being built. The Whigs are a thing and kind of die out. And then we get the Civil War and then we get the new Republican Party and we have the Democratic Party there. And we eventually get to this thing called the, the Permanent Appropriation Act of 1929, where Congress capped the people's power at 435 and as since then the population has tripled and so what is that that is that's a gradual abridgment of the people's power um that is slowly turning the legislature into an aristocracy those are kind of the problems that we're facing today um so let's recap real quick um i know i, I kind of covered a lot of stuff there but uh if i had to Boil it down, we had the French and Indian War, um, which led to the American Revolution, no taxation without representation. Uh, we've Declaration of Independence, we freed ourselves, we uh, won the American Revolution, we formed our first uh, Congress, or our first uh, Union, and that was an Articles of, it was a Confederation of States, it was the Articles of Confederation, the weakness of the Articles of Confederation kind of led to Shays' Rebellion, which led to the Federal Convention, which led to the new Constitution, which was this new layered republic that divided, separated, and balanced power and took that power, invested it into representatives as close to the problem as possible, as close to where you live as possible, so as many people, as many different interests could have a say as possible. Your first Federalist leaders were James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. Your anti-Federalist leaders were Patrick Henry, George Mason, and uh, I, I have Sam Adams written down here, but I got to double check that. Um, and then your first parties, real parties, were the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. You had Madison switch over to the Democratic Republican side. He was teamed up with Jefferson. You had Hamilton and Adams who didn't even like each other on the Federalist side. <laughs> and it became, how is government going to work? At first, it was what is going to, is government going to be and, and who is going to have the power and how is that power going to be uh, divided and and then in superior and then next it was okay we've already decided all of that how are we gonna how are we gonna make this work how are we going to manipulate that power to get our interest to do the things that we think are most important and that's where you kind of have this burgeoning divide um this partisan divide if you will um that starts and never really ends you know parties are kind of natural life people grouped together in things that make them feel comfortable and and things that they see and their interest and whatnot. So that's just a little recap of a uh, little recap of what we went over for history. Whew, that was a lot, don't you think? I feel like I kind of get going and I just get talking and it's like I'm not even like, I don't know. I just go.
Um, so let's do, well, let's do the book of Job. So the, um, on the last episode of the show, I was kind of talking about my discouragement. Um, and I think discouragement kind of leads, it leads to bitterness, you know, in an individual and I'm no different, um, than any other individual. We're kind of broken, uh, imperfect human beings. And I was having a conversation with a good friend of mine and I was kind of just, man, I was just complaining, you know, I'm just letting out all my frustrations. I try to keep it in. I try to seek the positive and everything that I see. And I try to grow the positive and everything that I do. And sometimes it just feels like no matter what you do, you just, you're spinning the wheel. You're not moving forward. You're not accomplishing. Like you don't, my thing is, is like, I don't know what his plan is. I don't know what God's plan is for me but I'm trying to follow it as closely as I can listening to the people that I think I should listen to, you know, the people that know me the best, the people that are willing to tell me the things that I don't really want to hear sometimes. And I'm trying to follow that advice. I'm trying to do a lot with, you know, because I feel this conviction, because I feel this responsibility, you know, I'd, I feel like God didn't send me on this path for me to sit on my hands and not do anything. Every power you have is a responsibility. And the knowledge that I have and my ability to, you know, to communicate is a power in its way. And, and it's not a power that I seek to wield. It's a power I seek to share uh, with people, with with my community with our country and I feel it a responsibility. Um, but it's hard to understand where that power is best suited and understand, you know, some people are going to want you to do things for them. And some people are going to want you to do things for you. And it's hard to know. It's kind of like the government, right? It's kind of like, you know, whose interest is my interest and whose interest is their interest. And are they giving me interest for mine? And, you know, and and it's not even as people give you tell you things based on what they want you to do. It's just they tell you things based on what they see, and they can't see everything, and you can't see everything, and that's kind of the problem. That's why we that's why we follow God's plan. And so I was, like I said, I was just sitting down. Uh, it was at Great Main Brewery, of course, because that's my jam. Um, and I'm just venting. I'm just complaining. I am sad. I am like fighting, just sinking of discouragement. And he said, have you read the book of Job? And I said, no, I haven't read the book of Job. And he said, you should read the book of Job. And he kind of took me through it a little bit. And uh, today I, I, I woke up, uh, I went to church, I sat and I read like 15 chapters of Job. I went in my service, I came out, I finished it, and I figured, let's talk about that. I, I, you know, I thought it was good advice telling me to read the book of Job. So uh, Job is, for those who don't know, uh, Job is tested by Satan with God's permission. He loses his wealth, possessions, and family. He is a dutiful citizen, if you will, citizen of God. Uh, citizens, not servant. Servant's a better word. Uh, he's a dutiful servant of God. Everything in his life, or most things in his life, are fairly good until this moment, and he's now significantly tested by losing his wealth, his possessions, his family. And so, in the book of Job, it's basically a series of dialogues uh, between Job and others, um, and Job is expressing his bitterness and his frustration, and others are trying to steer Job towards God and faith and understanding and Job seeks understanding, but it's hard because Job's human and he's flawed and he's not God and he can't know everything. And I think that's kind of the message that God sends here is, look, I understand you're frustrated. I understand you're bitter. Um, you won't always understand everything. And if you want to be successful and you want to follow God's plan, you you have to have faith. Um, and so I got a few things highlighted here. I just want to kind of talk about. So in Job's first speech, chapter three, uh, this is, uh, 311. And he says, why wasn't I born dead? 
why didn't I die as I came from the womb? And this, this might not hit with a lot of people because, you know, we each have our own individual experiences and what we live through. And one of my experiences that I lived through was knowing that when I was born, one of my lungs collapsed and I've actually got this, you probably can't see it. Um, I've got this pretty substantial scar on my neck and I was on this machine called an ECMO machine as a baby. I, I remember being told this story over and over again. I had to go back and forth to the hospital as a child for like checkups as the growth of my lungs and brain development to make sure I was on par with everybody else. And I was always told about the story about how my lung collapsed. I was rushed from, I believe, Fauquier Hospital to uh, Children's Hospital in D.C. And they put me on this machine called an ECMO machine. It was experimental at the time. The way the story I've been told is basically nobody had been on that machine had survived without brain damage. And my parents were, you know, they were, I mean, young, young people in their 20s. I can only imagine as, you know, as I grow up and I and become a parent, I can only imagine what it must have been like to have your first child, to have the doctors come in the room and say, the lungs didn't develop fully, uh, can't breathe on their own. Uh, we need to put them on this special machine. And by the way, probably going to end up da brain damage if he survives, but realistically, he's only got a 10% 10, 10 chance of surviving. And I think that a lot. I think, why was I, why, why, why was I not born dead? Why did I not just die? What was my, what is my purpose here? And I thought this a lot as a child growing up and uh, struggled with it in a lot of ways, trying to understand my place and my understanding of the world. And so when I read it, I was like, man, I, I don't think my friend even understands how deep, like I did, I had no idea what I was getting into when I got into the book of Job. And uh, it kind of really, you know, it's not to say that I'm bitter about being alive. I'm, I'm very happy. In fact, uh, well, happy is a state of mind, right? It's a, a state of moment. Um, I would say I try to be happy. I, you know. I do love life. I love, I love everything I do for the most part. I mean, I hate the failure. <laughs> I hate the fear, you know, but I mean, I love life. Um, and so I'm not bitter about being alive, but sometimes I am bitter about feeling like I'm not living up to it. Like I was given, everybody's given a gift to be alive. It is a gift to be alive. And some are given an additional gift of extra help to be alive. And I feel obligation and responsibility to do something with that. And sometimes I wonder if it was a mistake, this gift of life that was given to me, this extra hand that was placed to help me out. And um, it gets me down. I'm not going to lie. It, it weighs on my shoulders sometimes. Um, and so it was good to read through this. Um, we let's get to another part here before I get too emotional. Um, so, <laughs> and and so I think this this might be where the suggestion came from. I was basically complaining. I don't do anything. I work all the time. It's hard not to work for me. I know it sounds strange. I used to have so many habits or so many like hobbies, and it's not that I'm intentional about cutting out hobbies. It's that sometimes I have to cut out hobbies because I have more important things I have to focus on. I have a family, I have different responsibilities. And sometimes I cut out hobbies because I'm sacrificing. So I'm not, you know, making as much money so I can't afford to do the things. And then you do that for a really long period of time and you look up and you realize you, you don't exist. You as an individual don't exist. The things that you love, the things that you used to do for yourself don't really exist. You exist as a husband. You exist as a father. You exist as a citizen. But you as an individual, myself, I, I, and this is the line. This is 32026. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest. Only trouble comes. And I don't really feel like that, you know, like I don't really, but I do feel sometimes like I, there is no rest. I can't really rest. Even when I rest, I'm thinking, I'm worried, I'm, you know, whatever. And I shouldn't be that way. I should have more faith. I should believe in his word and be patient for what will come. And 
so this is the one that drives this is so this is the thing um oh man i lost my place here so uh this is elzava elvis elvis i can't pronounce this guy's name um response he continues this is chapter five um three i have seen that fools may be successful for the moment but then comes sudden disaster and like i think of this like 15 minutes of fame thing when i read that you know like sometimes i get better that somebody might go viral for saying something really stupid or just the news cycle in general because we're always focused on just the dumbest things and i think like hey i feel like i have information that people should want to know why can't why can't that go viral you know like why can't apportionment go viral <laughs> i mean i know why it can't go viral it's not it has to be taught people need to know about it before it can go viral um but <laughs> it's silly it, it, you know i kind of and i i should keep that in mind and i say well you know the fools they're successful for the moment but their moment will end and it will it'll come to a sudden disaster and i don't want it to come to a sudden disaster but according to this you know it might happen that way um so this uh go through here. So this is kind of dark. Um, and this is this is something that I've I've struggled with most of my life. Um so this so this is uh Job uh chapter seven, sixteen. And this is Job speaking. He cries out to God, I hate my life and I don't want to go on living. That's a tough one because it's like like, I don't want to die. I, I've never wanted to die. I want to be alive. I want to live. I want to love. I want to see my children grow older. I want to see my parents as much as possible. I want to experience as much life as possible. But there are moments where I look at myself and I look at all my mistakes and I look at all my, my flaws and I can't see anything in myself other than my mistakes. And I feel unworthy to be here. And I feel, I feel like I hate myself. And I know that that's not true. And it's something I've I've done for too long. Is sometimes I'll be driving in the car, and I will get all emotional here. Um, if you know me, I'm an emotional person. So please take it easy. <laughs> um, I get in the car. I'm driving alone and I'm literally, my brain is just like rolling through checklist after checklist, things that I need to do, things that I should have done. I'm reliving moments in my life that I probably shouldn't be reliving. And I'm going, I hate myself. I'm talking to God in my car and I'm saying, God, I hate myself. And you know what he says back to me now? He says, don't say that. You shouldn't hate yourself. I made you. I made you and I made you for a reason. And you can't hate yourself if you love me because I love you and you should love you. But in my discouragement, sometimes I still say it and I try not to. And I correct myself. I said it the other day in my discouragement. I said, God, God I hate myself. And I could hear God calling back to me and I, he could say, don't say that. That's silly. And I think about it in like, I think about my kids in this instance, and I think about my my kids. You know, we're um, I got that whiteboard out because I'm teaching teaching the girls math. You know, and some things are harder for kids to learn than others, and this is where children start to go through discouragement in their lives for the first time. And not that my kids have said it, but I can only imagine how I would feel as a parent if I heard my kids say it. And that would make me feel pretty crappy as a parent. <laughs> um, and I think like God gave me this blessing of life and he gave me this extra blessing of, you know, extending my life when it should have been shorter, much shorter, so short. I wouldn't have had much of a consciousness or any consciousness at all. I could have been born dead. 
And I think that's not nice. <laughs> that's not loving. That's not respectful. Um, and uh, yeah, so don't do that. Note to self, uh, try to get better, try to work harder. Um, so through these dialogues, uh, Job is, he's kind of complaining about God. He's complaining about everything. He, and, um, the push from from the people that he talks to and from from god is it's best uh summed up in uh zophir's response to job this is chapter 11 18 and it says having hope will give you courage you will be protected and will rest in safety you will lie down unafraid and many will look for you for help but the wicked will be blinded. They will have no escape. Their only hope is death. And for me, that's that's been my big thing. That was my big call into government. Is I felt like I felt like there was no hope. Can you see that? I felt like there was no hope. And when I started reading and studying, I was like, there's a lot of hope here. People aren't focused on the right things. All we just need somebody to talk about the right things and we can get ourselves on track. And then, you know, when I got into government or, you know, politics or whatever you want to call it, and I met people and the people in power don't have any hope. And the reason they don't have any hope is because they have no faith. They have no faith in you. They have no faith in me. They don't really believe people can understand this stuff. You want to talk about apportionment? Nobody's going to understand that. Well, yeah, but they should understand it. It's extremely important to their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, it doesn't affect your day-to-day -day life other than take power away from you and give it to them. So yeah, I can see why you don't want to talk about it, but they want to talk about it. They just don't know about it. And because you refuse to talk about it, you're stripping them of this opportunity. And even people that want it, you know, they, they take the same position. They go, well, it's not going to make any difference because nobody knows. And it's like, well, yeah you're stripping them of hope. You're stripping us all of hope by simply turning your backs and not talking on this thing. And what I, what I tell, what I try to tell people that I meet is like, if you really believe this thing that I'm talking about, which is the apportionment thing and, and balancing power and representation, representation for people, then you must talk about it. You must talk about it. You must have hope. You must talk about it with hope. You must speak about it with passion. You must explain it. You must be teaching it. You must be patient with it. And in that, there is hope. There is hope in simply just doing that and sharing that information. Because information is power, okay? And power is meant to be shared. You know, if God has all power, but humans don't have all power. He divided that power amongst all of us. And we can only see what we can see and we can only know what we can know. And it's important that we wield the power that God gave us in the way that he wants us to wield it. And he wants us to share it with each other. He, that's what he wants. That's what I think he wants. I don't know. How could I possibly know? <laughs> and, you know, through this, through these dialogues, This one uh, struck me here. This is uh, 1326. This is a response. Or Job asks how he has sinned. And he says, you write bitter accusations against me and bring up all the sins of my youth. And for that, I just thought about me and a parent. And I thought about like parents talking to their teenage child and the kid going, dude, I'm like, I'm 17 now. You're talking about something I did when I was nine. Like I learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, think we all we all feel that way. It's hard. It's hard for people to forget things sometimes, and it's hard for people to move on, and it's hard for people to realize that people changed. Um, let's see here. Uh, 
Uh, and this is this is this is where this is where it comes, you know, uh, full circle, like the bitterness, the frustration. And it's like, what, you know, for me as an individual, where does my bitterness and frustration come from? My frustration is not really at God. Um, I guess maybe you could perceive it that way. But I like I do feel like God is is laid a path out for me. And I do feel like I've I've tried my best to follow it. My frustration is kind of at myself and a lot of, you know, I look back and I think of all the different areas where I went left and where I could have gone right, or I went right when I could have went left. And I think back and I go, did I go the right way? Was I, is that, was that the way that God wanted me to go? Um, and I get bitter and frustrated and angry at myself for maybe making the wrong decision, but maybe I, maybe I already made the right decision and maybe it's just a matter of time and maybe I'm just being impatient and I can't know. I can't know. I can't know everything. I can't see everything. I can't understand everything. I can only understand what I can understand. And I can only know what I know. And everything else, I need to follow this, which is uh, 2221. Submit to God and you will have peace. Then things will go well for you. And man, if if I can't relate to that, um, Because that discouragement that I have is, I guess it's a lack of faith. Maybe it's not a lack of faith in God. Maybe it is. Maybe it's a lack of faith in others. Maybe it's a lack of faith in myself. And maybe that itself is a lack of faith because I'm supposed to believe in others. I'm supposed to believe in myself just as I believe in God. And that discouragement sends me in a spiral of fear. And I'm I'm scared of what... If I'm doing the right thing, if I'm following the right path, if I'm listening to the right uh, to the right message, and today at service um, at Park Valley, I uh, pastor said, "On the other side of fear is a breakthrough," and I was like, "Man, I've noticed that. I've noticed that over the last few years. Every moment that I fall into uh, a moment of discouragement, where I." And and those are the moments where I, you know, if I'm being honest with you, I dislike myself the most. Um, those are the moments where all the bitterness comes to the surface and all the frustrations um, get expressed. And I don't like that. I don't like that about myself. I wish I didn't do that. Um, but I have noticed that it is almost freed in a sense that the next day or the next couple of days, a light clicks something happens there's i'm led there's a path that opens up and i'm able to walk down it i'm given a purpose i'm giving something to do and so when i heard that today i was like man that is that's on par you know and then there was something else that uh that barry said today that really struck me particularly because i had literally just read the line that i'd read to you um from the book of job where it says why was I not born dead? Or why wasn't I born dead? And, you know, Barry wasn't talking about the book of Job at uh, church today. We were in the book of Acts. But what he said was he saved us for a reason. He saved us for a reason. And I guess you could go you could go two routes with that. For me, um, I had to be saved to be alive. I could have been born dead. And... I was saved again about a year ago when I got baptized and I, I built a relationship with God and I built a relationship with Jesus. And I have my, my middle son was saved uh, just, a, just a month ago, almost a year to the day that I was. And, you know, to fight through the discouragement, to fight through everything that you're fighting, to push off the fear and turn it into hope, I think you have to believe that he saved saved us for a reason. And... It's funny that I tell people, I think, you know, who is God? What is God? You know, can we define it? I don't know if we can. You know, we as people, we can define it in the word of the Bible and in, in the word of God. But like, we don't truly know. We've never seen him. We don't touch him. We have this relationship through text with him. We have this relationship through fellowship with him. But we don't know him, know him like we know ourselves. and. I think it's important to remember that he saved us for a reason. And it's important to remember that there is a purpose and there is a plan. And 
you know, you're going to feel discouraged and you're not going to be perfect. And he knows that. And he's going to forgive you. You need to forgive yourself. And on the other side of that fear is a breakthrough. And so uh, there's my little story about the book of Job, my my day at church. Um, and then so, oh man. So we get into like the parenting husbanding uh, section of the show. So my wife and I got into a little tiff today. So my perception was it started when we got home. It really started in the car on the drive home from church. I made, uh, so my wife made pasta salad uh, for one of our meals. We do meal prep, we do meal planning. And through the, you know, this is something that my wife and I did together regularly all the time through the change of my career and what I'm doing. I've, I do less of that responsibility and she does more. And when she was prepping and writing the menu, she was asking my advice and I just said, Hey, make less pasta salad than you normally make. I think that sometimes you make a little too much and we have to throw it away. Da, da, da. And so when she was making the pasta salad, I was like, hey, babe, how much pasta salad did you make? Because it looked like it was a lot. You know, I was just asking a question. And then in the car ride home, I made the comment. I was like, hey, by the way, I don't, we were, it, it was in the context of the conversation, but I was just threw it in there. By the way, I think you still made too much pasta salad. Now, for me, I don't see this as a big deal. Um, but she has a different perspective because she sees a different point of view than I see. And so we get home. I'm trying to make myself some lunch. I'm looking for this sheet tray. We've got this this half sheet tray that I like to use when I'm just putting one little thing in the oven. Um, and I asked my wife about it and I had looked for this the other day and I couldn't find it. And I was like, ah, I bet you she got rid of it. My wife loves to clean and keep things decluttered and I struggle with that and she is better than, at it than I. And... um. So I asked her about it. I said, hey, do you know where that pan is? And at first she's like, um, did you look? <laughs> I mean, because that's a pretty good response for me. It's like, did you actually look? Like, I know you opened the cabinet, but did you really look? And I'm like, yeah, I really looked. I like got up there with a the stool the other day. And then she like kind of went back and forth. And then she was like, you know, I cleaned out the kitchen a month ago or whenever it was. And I went through things and I checked with you. And if I... I think it got I think it got tossed and you approved it. And in my head, I'm like, there's no way I approve this. I love that pan. I do not want to get rid of that pan. And so like in my head, I'm like, okay, cool. Do you know which one it is? Like, and I'm trying to ask this as nicely as I can. I'm like, do you know it? Are you sure? Did you get rid of it or did you not get rid of it? Like, I love this pan. I know how I feel about this pan. So if I'm like, if I see this pan sitting on the island and it's in the throwaway pile, my first thought is, no, don't throw away my pan, you know? <laughs> and so like, I'm thinking like, no, I don't think it was there or I don't think I really approved it. And in this process, I am now a little frustrated in the conversation. I'm frustrated because I'm just trying to figure out if the pan's here. And if she knows if the pan's gone. And I feel like she may know that the pan's gone, but she's kind of dancing around it. And I make a little snide comment about how she always throws things away. And that is both true and untrue in the fact that she does throw things away, but she does a really good job of communicating with me and asking me. And sometimes I'm just really stubborn and I don't want to throw away things. And I say no and no and no. And she's patient, patient, patient. And sometimes it just sits there and I finally break down and go, yeah, let's get rid of it. Or she'll just take it and be like, look, you know you were going to get rid of it. Just let's move on. Um, and so the combination of these two things caused my wife to be very upset at me and caused us a little bit more tension than we were looking for today. And we kind of separated, you know, you do that thing where you get, both of you are tense, voices get raised, you go, you hit the, the bell dings and you go to your separate corners. <laughs> Kids are outside playing. Um, finishing up making my lunch I go over to my wife and I go hey I'm not a perfect man and I'm sorry <laughs> and she says I'm not a perfect woman and I'm sorry and then we kind of have a conversation about it and at this time 
I don't even, I'm not even thinking about the pasta salad in the, in the, you know, that comment didn't hit me. That it didn't hurt me. It didn't bother me. I didn't know it bothered her. And, she, you know, it's the first thing she brings up. And she explains it. And I get exactly why she's frustrated. It does sound like a dig. You know, it is frustrating. And, you know, then she goes into the, to the sheet tray thing and she kind of you know says a lot of things i already said which is like you know you you're not good at this you don't really want to throw things away you want to hold on to things all the time and and we've we've have a lot of kids and we've got limited space even though we have a lot of space it's it's always limited and you know my my argument my when i said back to her was hey look i'm really sorry about the you know the pot for the pasta salad thing i was like in my opinion, I just wish you wouldn't take that so hard. You know, for me, we both know how to cook and we both know how to make things and whatnot. And my argument here is I'm trying to share information with her. You know, like I've I've had to throw out extra pasta salad a couple of times. She doesn't know that because she didn't. She's not the one who threw it out. I'm not going to her every time I throw something out of the kitchen and going, "Hey, pasta salad didn't. We, we made too much this time. We ended up having to throw it out because it went bad." No, I mean that's just not something that happens. It's just when we go to make pasta salad, I'm trying to share that information with her, and I'm trying to make a note of it as we go through the process of like as our family like expands and contracts because one kid moves out other kids grow the you know we have one kid that's uh shared custody so it's you know we have one less kid this week i'm just trying to take all that into a factor and so we make sure that we make the right amount of food so we're not wasting anything and the way that my wife and i you know sometimes see things is differently she sees things very black and white and i see things in 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 layers and in grays um, for me, the pasta salad thing was just me sharing information for her. It was like, look, I'm the one putting in the work. I'm the one doing all this stuff. And she kind of wants control over it. She kind of, she, she kind of feels like she, she knows best and she's right. I mean, she is absolutely right. Those who are doing the work do know best. That's, you know, let's bring this back to our government a little bit, right? That's the idea of the layered Republic. That's the idea of the state Republics and the federal Republic and reserving rights to the States, to the people that are actually on the ground, doing the work. Um, she's not wrong in that aspect, but neither am I. Sometimes an outside voice, an outside perspective is instrumental in helping the efficiency of that. Um, and, you know, my argument to her or my conversation with her is like, let's just, let's just, let me do a, let me do a better job of communicating to you my point. Because I'm I'm a little passive in my delivery. I'm a little, you know, sarcastic in it. And that can be perceived, you know, depending on what's going on and like how, excuse me, how you're, you know, maybe, maybe she's discouraged. I mean, gosh, she just had she had just had to deal with me being discouraged the day before. That probably wore on her, you know. And so um I need to do better with that. And then the sheet pan thing, I was right out of the gate. I'm like, look, I made that situation bad because when when I didn't get the answers that I was looking for, I got frustrated. And my my sharp tongue sometimes wields itself the way I don't, you know, without thought. And, uh, you know, I I don't know exactly what I said, but I know I said something snide to the fact that she always throws things away. And this is creates bitterness between us. It creates bitterness in her. And I'm the one who did that. And, you know, I'm the one that, uh, you know, broke that communication line because when you create the bitterness, it makes it hard to talk about anything else anymore. And so I said, you know, I'm sorry. I did that. There's nothing else, you know, there's no really excuse for it other than the fact that I'm not perfect. <laughs> I'm not perfect. And I'm trying to be better every day. Um, and this is kind of how, I get better is by you calling me out <laughs> and you helping me and forgiving me. And, and, you know, she kind of said, said her piece. Um, she was sorry. She wasn't perfect either. And she understood, uh, understood my percept, my, my perspective on the pasta salad and the, and, you know, we're going to do a better job of uh, talking about, you know, the size of dishes <laughs> as we, 
meal prep and whatnot so we can both be on par on the same page and when it comes to uh you know having disagreements we're just gonna be a little bit more straightforward of like answering the questions and not letting our feelings get in the way of me you know being the guy that i am <laughs> And so uh, last thing uh, we'll talk about tonight, this is a long podcast here. Uh, so the last thing we're going to talk about is just my article in the Freeman newsletter. So I actually wrote this a few weeks ago. Um, if you've followed my politics parenting, if you know me as an individual, one thing you'll know is I love King of the Hill. I always like to tell people my dad is kind of like Hank Hill. Um, and... Uh, I wrote this, uh, it's it's basically, it's about the first episode of King of the Hill, the pilot episode. And in the pilot episode, Bobby is hit by baseball at a baseball game. And uh, Hank has a fit at the store on the way home from the baseball game. Somebody calls CPS, they show up, and they investigate. And this guy who investigates tries to take Bobby away. Like he misinterprets the information that he's given. He sees only simp uh, snippets of what's going on. He misinterprets that he's gung ho with power. He's from out of state and he tries to take Bobby away from Hank and Peggy. And in doing this, he also undermines Hank and Bobby's or Hank and Peggy's authority over Bobby, which creates a behavioral problem in Bobby because now he he is not. He is not respectful of his parents' authority, so he's acting out. He's testing the boundaries, pushing that authority further. And so, look, in the story, Hank is not a perfect father. He yells and screams at his son, and that's not great. And we all yell and scream at some point in time. We all have, our, like I said, you know, we are all imperfect creatures. And, you know, as parents, we try our best to, you know, have conversations and not yell and scream. But Sometimes it happens, but that doesn't mean that we should lose our children. That doesn't mean that we're bad parents and that we don't love our kids. What it does mean is that we're human beings. And kind of the point of the story here is like, who's supposed to be in charge of the kids? Is it supposed to be the state or is it supposed to be the parents? And who is best suited to take care of the kids? And we can we can break this down in in government. And it's just like, who, you know, it's groups. Every group needs a leader and that leader should have authority over their group. And the family's leader is the mom and dad and they should have authority over the children and they should have supreme authority. They should, they should be the ones that have like the most power when it comes to their kids because they, the family are a group inside of another group. And one of those groups is the state. The state is this big group that has a lot of groups inside of it. It can't possibly see all the different little family groups. It can't possibly understand what's going on, all those different relationships to, to be able to make really difficult decisions like pulling a child away from a, a parent. Because who is going to love that child more than their parents? Now, I know there's lots of situations in the world where parents do terrible things to their children, and I can't even begin to fathom why that happens or explain it, but I just know that we can't rid ourselves of everything with passing authority from one group to the to a bigger group. That doesn't necessarily solve the problem. That just creates a different problem. And so, you know, um, let me read a little snippet here from my article. So Anthony is the uh, the agent, the, the CPS agent. Anthony is an inexperienced out-of-towner who has clear prejudices. Hank is a good-hearted man who is surrounded by incompetence, which causes frustration. Sometimes he allows the frustration to get the best of him. He unleashes his anger through loud yelling rants. Bobby is a typical kid who seeks to entertain himself through whatever means feels right. This is where frustration comes. When the state comes in and threatens to take Bobby, they undermine Hank's, Hank's parental authority. Bobby, a child, takes advantage of the weakened authority. Bobby wants to be an entertainer and is acting out. His acting out is often a way of getting someone to laugh. Bobby's increased acting out also relieves, 
reveals a deeper friction within the family. Hank, anger comes easy to Hank, but being vulnerable doesn't. Hank is often Hank is often loud when expressing his anger, but quiet when expressing his love. This leads Bobby to think that his dad doesn't love him. So I, I go on to talk about, let's see here. This episode warns of the dangers of government, influence over the family. The power of a large group is often wielded by individuals, in this case, the inexperienced biased social worker. So that's important to think, think about. Because when we talk about like who is supposed to have authority in a group, that should be the group's leaders, and every group has a leader, and those leaders should have authority over the those who follow. And you want to give you want to divest as much of the authority down to the group to the smallest leader group as possible. And so but it's important to remember when you pass that authority to the bigger group. That authority is not being wielded by a large group. That authority is being wielded by individuals inside of that group. So you are giving a large amount of power to an individual more than they realistically should be able to handle. Now, it's necessary in having a functioning society and a functioning government, but, and I go on to this in the, in the, the article, it's important to have a layered authority structure to check the big group's power and protect the small group's sovereignty. In this case, the boss's authority checked the social worker's power. He didn't just correct the mistake, he realized the bias of the individual and stripped him of his power. The episode also highlights the importance of strong family communication. In a family, the authority of the father is often checked by the mother, in this case, Peggy, who is there to encourage Hank to be vulnerable, and the show ends with Hank telling Bobby he loves him. Because at the core, love is the answer to most of your problems, behavioral or otherwise. And it's important to realize that there's going to be, there's got to be people in charge and it's going to create conflict and people are going to fight over who's in charge and whatnot. And the best, you know, the best way that we can handle this as a society is to understand about sharing that authority, sharing that power, dividing that power, separating that power, vesting it as we do in our our representatives, and you know, allowing those closest to the interest, say, representation, uh, power, authority. Um, the state shouldn't come in and take away the, the parents' authority willy-nilly, as it was in this case. Um, and because the state at the time in this episode of this fictional episode, because it was willy-nilly, because it was wrong, they had a system in place to stop this from happening. This was a good thing. This is an example of how a layered authority structure that has power that checks itself can actually work to protect people from an oppressive government. So this is a situation where the government is really functioning in the way that it should. It 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 understands that we are not perfect people. It understands that power will be wielded by individuals and that's why a layered authority structure that checks and balances power is the best. It's just the best. So um yeah, that's my show for tonight. So uh I appreciate you tuning in and listening um and yeah maybe i'll do this again i don't know hope you guys enjoyed it peace and love